Uh, I'm going to be speaking today uh, along with Dr. Mittal Mehta. Uh, my name is Anand Bhatt. I'm one of the glaucoma and cataract specialists here at the Eye Institute. Dr. Mehta mm -hmm. treats retina disease. And so we're going to talk to you about some of the most common conditions uh, that affect vision uh, and are uh, predominantly related to aging as a risk factor. So our objectives, as I uh, just mentioned, is we're going to talk about some of the most common diseases that affect vision with aging. So some of the most common causes of blindness worldwide are cataract. Uh, cataract is the most common cause. Uh, the nice thing about cataract is, for the most part, it's reversible. Uh, glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness. Uh, but unfortunately, when glaucoma causes vision loss, it's generally not reversible. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration is also another very common cause of uh, vision loss with aging. And uh, other common causes of eye, uh, eye disease with aging or diabetic eye disease and uh, problems uh, with corneal blindness. So who needs to see an ophthalmologist? At some point, everybody should have a baseline eye exam. The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that if you haven't had your eyes examined by age 40, you should probably have at least a baseline screening exam for eye diseases that otherwise wouldn't present with symptoms. Uh, if you have a history in your family of an eye disease, such as glaucoma, macular degeneration, or if you're diabetic, it may be a good idea to be screened even earlier and more often. Uh, after age 40, if your vision is normal and your screening exams have been normal, checking in at least once every five years gives you the opportunity to catch and arrest the progression of eye disease uh, if you do start to have any presentation of an eye disease. There's a lot of vitamins that are marketed for eye health, and you know a lot of them don't have substantial peer-reviewed evidence of having a real benefit for your eyes. Uh, there are some, however, that do, and I'm going to defer to my colleague, Dr. Mehta, to talk to you about that more, because mostly these pertain to uh, reducing the risk of macular degeneration. And so he's going to touch on this in more detail later. Something else that I do advocate as a supplementation for many of my patients uh, is omega-3 fatty acids because there is a benefit to using omega-3 fatty acids for dry eye disease. And more and more people are questioning whether it may have some benefit uh, in patients who have glaucoma and other age-related eye disease, although that still is not something that we've clearly delineated. But in general, omega-3 fatty acids have many other health benefits. So that is one thing I do encourage a lot of my patients to use uh, simply because we do know it has a great benefit for dry eye disease. Another question that comes up often is uh, what else can I do uh, in my lifestyle to help my vision, to improve my eye health? Uh, does using a computer or looking at my phone or a tablet for a long time damage my vision or harm my eyes? So there's not any damage that occurs per se from using screens or having a lot of screen time. Uh, one thing that does occur is that we often see something interesting and we don't blink as much as we normally would. And when you stay really focused, it gives the surface of your eye more time for the tears to evaporate and for dryness to occur. So something to keep in mind if you have a computer-based job or if you spend a lot of time uh, looking at a screen is to use artificial tears, to lubricate the surface of the eye, and to give your eyes a break from time to time to look away from the screen uh, so that your eyes can stay properly moisturized. And what other lifestyle modifications could be advised? Well, for your general health, regular exercise is always good. Uh, smoking cessation is especially beneficial for those who have macular degeneration, thyroid eye disease, uh, the use of UV blocking sunglasses, especially blue blocking sunglasses, so those that have brown tint, it can help to reduce the exposure of harmful light rays to the retina. That's something that Dr. Mehta, I'm sure, will touch on more. And of course, eye protection is of paramount importance when you're doing any activity where your eyes could be threatened by projectile objects, grinding metal, drilling, sawing, uh, a lot of sports 
uh, with small balls that could fly to the eye. Eye protection is uh, so important. So first thing that we should discuss is cataract. Cataract is the most common eye disease. Uh, you know, many of us often quote things that we learn in training, that we've seen our mentors discuss uh, as far as analogies in explaining disease. So one of my favorite things, uh, one of my favorite ways to explain cataract is that it's like birth, death, and taxes. Everybody has to deal with it at some point. So it's not something that uh, is a consequence of anything that you've done wrong or something that happens as a result of having poor health. It's just something that will happen with a long enough lifespan. And some people it happens earlier and others it happens later, but we all will deal with it at some point. So what's interesting is uh, the word cataract is actually an old Greek word that originates from uh, the word used to describe a waterfall. Because when the water falls over a cliff, it turns white. And uh, I guess the ancient Greeks, when they saw cataracts and they saw a white mature lens in an eye, thought that it looked similar to how the water looked falling off of a cliff. So even in Spanish, the word for waterfall, catarata, is uh, of that same derivation. So what's happening when you have a cataract? Basically, there is a, we'll start with some basic eye anatomy. This is an eye in cross section. There's a front clear window to the eye, which is the cornea. Behind that, there's a space called the anterior chamber. Then there's the colored part of the eye, which is the iris. And behind that, there is a lens, which focuses the light that comes through the cornea, through the anterior chamber. And this lens allows that light to be sharply focused on the retina, which is the film of the eye if the eye was a camera. Now, over time, this lens can become more opaque. As it becomes opaque, the ability of that lens to focus light on the retina the way that it's supposed to is hindered. And so the optical quality of the images that uh, somebody sees with cataract is hindered. So that's something that naturally happens as a process of aging. So it is the leading cause of blindness worldwide, but it is highly reversible in most cases. Although, sadly, a lot of regions of the world lack access to cataract surgery, so it does pro uh, provide a huge societal burden in the third world. Uh, impaired vision increases the risk of injury, so uh, a lot of things that can happen when you fall uh, as you age, such as hip fractures, uh, it can really set back the general health of patients. And in some patients who are prone to dementia, it worsens their mental decline more quickly. <coughs> Uh, the good news is cataract surgery is the most common and successful surgery in the world. And in terms of any surgery available, it has the best benefit in a measure called the quality adjusted life years. So the benefit in terms of lifestyle to patients who undergo successful cataract surgery is immense. So some people develop cataract at an earlier age than others. And why is that? Uh, we think that some people who have more exposure to sunlight, uh, patients who have uh, uncontrolled diabetes and high blood sugar for prolonged periods of time, patients who have systemic steroid use or trauma, or sometimes other systemic diseases can predispose patients to developing cataract at a younger age. So although we think of cataract as something that happens at a more advanced age in the 70s or 80s, uh, I do see patients who develop cataract uh, in childhood, in young adulthood, in their 40s, 50s, and uh, at any age. So another analogy that I learned from a mentor in describing the anatomy of a cataract is comparing it to a peanut M&M. So peanut m and it's a very popular candy. I'm sure everybody's enjoyed a peanut M&M at some point. Well, you should check it out. It's, it's a wonderful candy. It's got a candy coating on the outside. Inside of that candy coating, there's a layer of chocolate, and in the center, there's a peanut. So this is similar to the lens anatomy. The lens has a capsule outside of it. Inside of it, there's chocolate, which is the cortex, and the center is the nucleus, which is like the peanut in this analogy. And depending on what part of that peanut M&M has become uh, 
opacified over time, there are different types of cataracts. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures here of different types of cataracts. But you can see this is a white mature cataract. And uh, you're seeing the brunescence of this cataract as there's a slit beam that's shining across the thickness of this lens. So when the ancient Greeks looked at an eye that had a mature cataract, they saw this whitening and probably described it like they would a waterfall. So it's not common for most patients in the developed world to wait until their cataract becomes this dense because it does impair their lifestyle to a great degree. They can't get their licenses renewed at the DMV. They have trouble functioning with their daily activities. So this is not a common presentation. This is another variety of cataract where you can see the front coating, the capsule is clear, the center, the peanut is clear, but the posterior part of the candy coating, the posterior capsule, is opacified. This is something that can happen with steroid use. It's called a posterior subcapsular cataract. And here's a cataract that is white, but it looks like it has these spokes. And this is called a cortical cataract. Uh, this can happen because of diabetes, uh, because of steroid use. Sometimes it happens naturally because of aging. It's another presentation where basically the chocolate around the center has become opacified in a specific pattern, and we call it a cortical cataract. This can cause a lot of glare. Uh, if you see a specific degradation, one spot, uh, there are many other things that are more likely to explain it, but cataract generally causes an overall decrease in image quality. Here is another presentation of a mature cataract. And here's a really interesting cataract. I've only seen it once or maybe twice in practice. It's called a Christmas tree cataract. And it's associated with some very specific systemic diseases like myotonic dystrophy. Uh, but there is a plethora of different cataracts that we see. This is of the less common variety. Now, cataract surgery has come a long way. Uh, the first historical descriptions that we know of of cataract surgery come from ancient South India where they used a technique called couching. Uh, of course, you can see they have very sterile technique here. And uh, <laughs> this is the anesthesiologist holding the patient still. And they're using a sterilized instrument to basically create a small incision and press this lens until it falls into the back of the eye to clear this vision. Now, this isn't that different than what we were doing even all the way up until the 50s and 60s. Because basically, instead of using an instrument to press the lens into the back of the eye, we were removing this entire lens with a cryotherapy probe. So basically freezing it, and through a very large incision, removing the lens in its entirety. After this kind of surgery, because there was no lens inside the eye, patients had to wear very thick glasses uh, that people often described as Coke bottle glasses. Does anybody remember ever seeing those in their parents? Or? Yeah. And when cataract surgery was done in that period of time, there were very large incisions. So you can see here, uh, this is almost like delivering a baby from the eye. Uh, this entire lens is removed through a large incision that's almost a third of the cornea. And you use a special loop here with uh, water that irrigates from the tip. And you deliver this entire lens out outside of the eye with the capsule, the entire peanut m, &M. Uh, and then you close this incision, and patients stay in the hospital for several days and have very strict positioning requirements. Thankfully, that era is over because we figured out ways to use ultrasound technology to create small incisions to allow us to enter the eye and uh, with ultrasound energy break the cataract into pieces and implant artificial lenses so that we don't need to use such strong, thick glasses after surgery to focus light on the retina. So when we do cataract surgery in modern-day cataract surgery, uh, it's usually a day surgery. Uh, we usually don't need patients to be asleep. There's no injections or stitches involved. Uh, most patients are sitting up and sipping on juice 15 minutes after and can go home and remove their shield the same day. Uh, in this diagram, you can see that there is a small, less than three millimeter incision in the cornea, which ends up being self-sealing. Uh, this peanut m and &M, we've created the circular opening in the front candy coating, so the capsule is open. And then we use this ultrasound probe, which uses uh, 
small uh, ultrasound heat energy to break the chocolate uh, and a vacuum to remove the chocolate and break the peanut in the center, the nucleus, and remove it. Then we polish the entire inside of this capsule. And through the same incision, we can inject an artificial lens, which we fold like a small taco and inject through an injector into this capsule. And it centers itself and focuses light. Uh, it's really an amazing advancement compared to what cataract surgery used to be like three to four decades ago. And as a result of this smaller incision, we don't need patients to have very strict positioning. Patients can go home. Uh, usually, uh, you only need to wear a clear shield for a couple of hours after surgery. And when things are routine, there's much less post-operative care involved. So I also want to touch a little bit on what happens when we make a decision about implanting the lens inside the eye. Uh, and to really understand that, uh, it's important to first discuss a little bit about what's happening when you have a prescription. So I'm sure everybody has heard about nearsighted and farsighted. Anybody who has glasses uh, usually is aware of what condition they have. But basically, nearsighted means that you have a minus prescription. Usually, that means that the eye, in its length from the front to the back, is a little bit longer than what the normal eye anatomy is for somebody who doesn't have a prescription. And because of that, the light focuses through the cornea and through the lens just short of where the retina is. And they can see things well up close, but not far away. So glasses helps to modify the way that that light is refracted through the cornea and through the lens and helps it to focus precisely on the retina. In a far-sighted eye, it's the opposite situation. The length of the eye from the front to the back is usually a little bit shorter than normal. And that results in the light being focused just past where the retina is. And a pair of glasses will help to modify where it's being focused, so it places it right on the retina. So when we pick a lens to implant in the eye, it's based on individual patient measurements to know exactly what the curvature of the cornea is, what the length of the eye is, and we use formulas to predict exactly what the post-operative prescription would be to try to reduce that prescription as much as possible. So we've had good success for many decades being able to use what we call monofocal lenses to try to achieve one point of focus, usually for far away, because that allows patients to be able to see street signs, to be able to watch TV, and uh, to be able to ambulate safely without uh, the dangers that could come with falling or driving without being able to see what you need to see. However, up close, because you only have one point of focus for far away, uh, it does require reading glasses. And everything in between far away and up close also becomes a little bit difficult. So there are brilliant minds who have been working on a way to try to alleviate that problem. Here you can see a typical monofocal lens. Uh, this entire lens achieves one point of focus, usually for distance, although uh, we can target any point of focus with it, but we have to pick one point of focus. There are multifocal lenses, which you can see that there's many rings built into what looks like a monofocal lens. And these rings allow different points of focus to be achieved through each of these optical zones. Uh, and it's a wonderful technology that's still evolving. Uh, the predictability of this technology uh, still does need some improvement, but we do have some fantastic options that allow patients to be able to be less dependent on reading glasses and perhaps uh, computer glasses as well while trying to achieve good distance vision. So there are lenses available that help to have multiple points of focus. There are other lenses that try to achieve multiple points of focus by actually being able to use the muscles inside the eye to flex the lens and move the lens forwards and backwards as it needs to be. These have become less popular with time because they are usually less efficacious in being able to accomplish what we want. But this is another technology that's also being used to try to achieve multiple points of focus. And there are yet other lenses that try to correct something called astigmatism. <coughs> I'm sure everybody's heard the term astigmatism, but it's often confusing what is astigmatism. Uh, basically, astigmatism describes a special type of prescription where you're not just nearsighted or farsighted, but there is an irregularity to the prescription so that uh, a normal cornea or that front window of the eye is generally a spherical shape, uh, kind of like a basketball. 
Sometimes that cornea, if it's not perfectly spherical and is oblong in certain areas, uh, like a football, it may have certain areas that have a steeper prescription than the rest of the cornea, and that's called astigmatism. So with a monofocal lens or with a non-astigmatic lens, you will still have astigmatism as part of your prescription, even if we can reduce the nearsightedness or farsightedness as much as possible. So we do have lenses available that can help to correct astigmatism at the time of cataract surgery. So this is another diagram that uh, shows how this light is focusing. When you have astigmatism, that cornea doesn't allow the light to come into the eye very sharply, and the lens can't function properly if the input into the lens is not sharp. And so it achieves multiple points of focus, some on the retina, some in front, some behind the retina, in the back of the eye. So the light is scattered in an irregular pattern. When we correct astigmatism through glasses or with a lens that we implant at the time of cataract surgery, we can try to streamline all these multiple points of focus into one that's on the retina the way that we would want it to be. So the way that we describe this lens is a toric lens. And it has a special irregularity uh, built into the lens that allows it to have a stronger prescription just where you need it. So by aligning this lens with the shape of where that irregular prescription is, we can help to reduce the prescription as much as possible, even beyond reducing nearsightedness or farsightedness. And this is a really busy chart here that uh, covers a lot of what we've gone over. Uh, one thing to note here is that most insurances do cover monofocal lenses, but most insurances don't cover the other special features that are available for multifocal properties or correcting astigmatism. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about glaucoma. Glaucoma is a majority of what I do, but it's not something that's well understood in society because it's not as uh, commonly discussed like cataract. Uh, but in its most basic definition, glaucoma is really a group of diseases that have a couple of traits in common. One thing is that it's a progressive optic neuropathy. So basically there is damage to the optic nerve that happens slowly, progressively over time. And usually it's related to high eye pressure, but not always. Some patients have glaucoma at seemingly normal eye pressures as well. And this group of diseases usually results in the non-reversible loss of peripheral and if it's neglected, even central vision. So it's a silent disease in general. Most people don't know that it's happening because they don't feel pain. They usually don't sense a difference in the vision uh, at its outset. And so until it's affecting the center of vision, most patients wouldn't know it's there. And sadly, once it's gotten that bad, we really can't reverse or uh, improve on where they are. So it's very good to be aware if you're at risk for glaucoma, to be screened for it, and to be able to try to catch it early so that we can modify the course of the disease. So we've already gone over some basic eye anatomy, but basically in glaucoma, what's happening is the eye is producing fluid in the ciliary body, and that fluid comes forward in front of the lens, through the pupil, into the anterior chamber. This is a constant process, and it's balanced out by drainage, drainage that's occurring in the angle where the cornea and the iris meet. Uh, in some patients, that drainage is impaired, and as a result, the pressure in the eye rises. Uh, if the pressure rises over a long period of time, that starts to cause damage at the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a cable that's full of millions of fibers that transmits vision from the retina to the brain. So as you have progressive damage over time, you start to lose vision that's related to the fibers that are transmitting this vision in the optic nerve. Usually the first fibers to be damaged will affect the peripheral vision. Now when we look at the optic nerve, which is a key part of the examination uh, when we're checking for glaucoma, and here is a picture of the optic nerve head on in a normal patient, and over time in somebody who has early glaucoma and later glaucoma, the main thing that I wanted to point out here is that there's something called cupping that's occurring. Cupping means that uh, this pipeline is becoming hollowed out. That optic nerve normally has 1.2 million nerve fibers inside of it, and the space in the center of it is very small. So the ratio of that hollow area to the entire pipeline is usually 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And if it starts to become larger, 
usually that means that we're having some of these fibers thinning out. It could be as a consequence of glaucoma, or it could be that the pipeline is very large to begin with. But if we see this, we start to become suspicious that we want to check for glaucoma, because that is one potential reason that that hollowing could start to occur. So you can see here in the severe glaucomatous optic nerve, there is a large area that's hollowed out and a very bright yellow area in the center. So the cup to disc in this optic nerve may be close to 0.9 or 0.95, and that could indicate that there's been severe glaucoma damage. So a very common illustration of what it's like when somebody has glaucoma is a picture here comparing normal vision to glaucomatous vision. And I have patients who have very severe glaucoma and still read 2020 on the chart. And they often wonder, well, if my glaucoma is so bad, why am I still able to read the 2020 line? And it's difficult to understand until you can see a good illustration here that the central vision is still very good. That patients may not perceive that there is a difference in their vision, except that there's some loss of contrast and some overall dimness. But what's happening over time is that field of vision is constricting. Now, if a patient has one eye that's predominantly affected and both eyes are open looking straight ahead, it would be very difficult to notice that this peripheral vision has been lost until it's screened. So who gets glaucoma? Obviously, uh, our lecture today is about the aging eye. So aging is a big risk factor for glaucoma. Uh, but the biggest risk factor is family history. So having a sibling with glaucoma is the biggest risk factor. Having a parent with glaucoma is second. And having other family members with glaucoma can also predispose you too. So beyond family history and aging, being African American or Hispanic, uh, being over the age of 65, uh, some people think being diabetic or nearsighted can also predispose you. And I have many patients who didn't have a risk factor for glaucoma, but still did develop it for reasons that we really can't explain. So it's possible it could occur without these risk factors, but most patients do have some risk factor that has predisposed them. And as I had touched upon earlier, glaucoma is a group of diseases. So there is a plethora of different diseases that have the same feature of having progressive optic nerve damage and visual field loss. Uh, and sometimes we can identify a specific cause, sometimes we can't. So we can classify glaucomas as primary glaucoma or secondary glaucoma, and also by describing what the angle of the eye looks like. So the angle of the eye is where the cornea and the iris meet, and that's where fluid drains inside the eye. Some people have open angles, others have narrow or closed angles. And so uh, based on the etiology of the disease, whether it's primary or whether it's secondary to a, another process, or whether there's open angle or closed angle, we can classify the nature of each individual's glaucoma. And there are even glaucomas that occur at very young ages, such as congenital or juvenile glaucoma in childhood. So who should be screened? Anybody who has a parent or sibling with glaucoma should be screened at a pretty early age, uh, usually beginning in the third decade of life. Patients who are over the age of 60, especially those who are African American or Hispanic are at higher, rate, uh, are at higher risk. And uh, they should also have already had a baseline eye exam, but uh, if they haven't, they are at higher risk and should be screened for glaucoma. And patients who are on steroid medications for a prolonged period of time uh, also need to be screened, as steroids do have a side effect of raising eye pressure. And how is screening done? So it's most effectively accomplished by seeing an ophthalmologist who can do a basic eye exam, uh, especially consisting of things such as screening your intraocular pressure, examining the optic nerve, assessing your other risk factors for glaucoma. And if necessary, if there is suspicion because of the way your optic nerve looks, uh, family history, the way uh, your pressure is measured, uh, then there are other things that can be assessed as well, such as your visual field, uh, scans of the optic nerve. So here's a picture of a machine that's used frequently in glaucoma clinics. Some of you may be familiar with this. Basically, this is a special device that allows us to have patients uh, cover one eye at a time while they're looking straight ahead. There are lights that are shown in a field, and we can assess whether patients are able to detect these lights when they click a button. 
and map out exactly what their vision looks like uh, with this graphical analysis. And this can tell us whether some peripheral vision has been lost and in what pattern in glaucoma, and to assess over time when there has been vision loss, whether it's progressing or whether it's stable. Uh, so this is a very effective tool in screening and also on, in the ongoing treatment of glaucoma. We can also do an analysis of the optic nerve to very precisely measure how thick the fibers are in the optic nerve and compare to other healthy age-matched eyes. So this is a picture of the optic nerve in the right eye and left eye. And this map can assess the thickness. Normally we see that the superior and inferior parts of the optic nerve have more thickness. And so we see this hourglass shape to the scan. And we can see in this deviation map if there are any areas that have thinning of the optic nerve compared to normal. Here we can see some red, but this is a function of a test abnormality where the signal has dropped out. At the bottom here, we see that it's all completely green. And this is an analysis that allows us to compare your optic nerve to other healthy age-matched eyes. So both of these tests are very key tools in order to assess whether you have glaucoma and whether the nature of your glaucoma is stable or progressive. Once we know that somebody has glaucoma, the principal way we intervene is to lower the eye pressure. Uh, we have many classic studies in glaucoma that have tracked glaucoma patients over time. And right now, lowering eye pressure is the most effective tool that we have to arrest the progression of glaucoma. Uh, usually the first step in lowering the eye pressure is through medications. So we have many eye drops that we can use uh, that are very effective in lowering eye pressure and can work in conjunction with each other to treat the vast majority of patients in the early stages of disease. Uh, it used to be, even looking back two decades ago, we only had two agents that could help to control eye pressure. And many patients complained that the uh, treatment for glaucoma was worse than the disease. Patients had small pupils, they couldn't see well because the medicines would cause headaches and constriction of the pupils. Uh, a lot of patients would become allergic to the medicines. It would slow people's heart rates, make them feel lethargic. So thankfully, we have many new options. And even just within the last year, there are new uh, pipelines for glaucoma treatment uh, that are available uh, for topical medical treatment of glaucoma. Uh, some patients don't do well with medical treatment, though. And uh, even if somebody has done well for a long time with medical treatment, drops can lose their effects over time and glaucoma can become more aggressive. When that happens, we have other options, such as lasers and surgery. Uh, there are lots of lasers that we do for treatment of eye disease, so it often gets confusing. Uh, patients often ask me, how is this different than LASIK? Or I had a laser for my diabetes, how is this different? Uh, basically, in glaucoma, there's two main lasers that we can do. Uh, but the one that we would use to lower pressure allows us to use laser energy to stimulate the drain inside the angle. And by stimulating the drain, there is a uh, molecular remodeling that's happening of that drainage tissue that allows it to be more porous and have a better capacity to drain fluid. So here's an illustration of what that looks like. And there are many different varieties of laser trabeculoplasty. Argon is one that we have available. There's selective laser trabeculoplasty, micropulse. We have all of these available here. Uh, but this is argon in sp uh, specific here. And you can see here is a gonioscopic view. So that means that we've placed a special tool, a contact lens that has mirrors built into it that allow us to view this angle where the cornea and iris meet. And we can use this aiming beam to precisely target laser energy to the drain. That allows that drain to become stimulated to drain better. There are also surgeries that we can perform that help us to create new drainage systems by creating fistulas or by using implants that connect to the inside of the eye with tubes that allow fluid to be drained out of the eye. Uh, here is one example of a surgery called trabeculectomy, which is one of our older, more uh, traditional glaucoma surgeries that is performed when we really need to get the pressure as low as possible and try to spare somebody of using drops. So basically what we can do with trabeculectomy is create a flap on the wall of the eye under which we can uh, create a small fistula either manually or by inserting a very small express shunt that allows fluid to come from inside the eye to outside the eye. The skin of the eye, which has been retracted here, is sewn back over this portion of the eye where we've created the flap and it results in a bleb 
or a bubble of fluid that trickles out from underneath this flap and drains by the veins that surround it. So that's one way that we can accomplish a new drain. Another is to use a device called a glaucoma implant. A glaucoma implant rests on the outside wall of the eye and has a tube that comes out of the front that connects to the inside of the eye and allows the fluid inside the eye to collect around the body of the glaucoma implant and the veins that surround it will drain it. So these are two ways that we can create new drains. There are even other surgeries that we can do to try to enhance the natural drain beyond laser. So one variety of that surgery that was actually invented here at UCI is trabectome. Trabectome is something that allows us, uh, through the same type of incision that we do in cataract surgery, to approach the angle with a small electrocautery device that removes tissue that covers the drain. So here you can see that there is a blue tissue that's covering the drain. It's like a strainer in your kitchen sink. Uh, that strainer provides an additional resistance to fluid that's trying to leave the sink. And this electrocautery device uses uh, ablation technology to remove that strainer tissue so that fluid can more easily access the drain. And as it's come across the angle here, you can see that these collector channels are more available to the fluid in the anterior chamber so that the natural drain can function better. So this is something that can be an option in milder varieties of glaucoma to try to enhance the natural drain. There are also other devices, uh, stents. So eye stent is another device that was invented by one of our doctors here. Uh, it's uh, often described as a snorkel that can be used to pierce through that uh, drainage tissue so that fluid in the anterior chamber can enter that drainage canal without having to go through the strainer tissue. So both of these procedures are often combined with cataract surgery to try to enhance the control of glaucoma. So what are our challenges? Uh, like we touched upon earlier, glaucoma doesn't have symptoms that people can recognize, such as pain or vision loss early on. So a lot of people who have it don't know they have it. And despite the diagnosis uh, of glaucoma, because some cases are not caught early on, 10% of patients will lose vision despite all of the best efforts on their part to use drops and to seek care. And at some point, uh, some patients can still become legally blind. So the best way to reduce that risk is to find the disease as early as possible and to initiate treatment as early as possible. And that can help to increase the chance that a patient wouldn't suffer from vision loss during their lifetime as a result of glaucoma. Also, even if you're adherent with the medicines, they can lose some effect over time. And glaucoma surgery, even when it's successful, doesn't last forever. So it's something that does require ongoing monitoring and care. And when things change, we want to identify it and change the course of our treatment. So in summary, screening is of paramount importance to be able to identify glaucoma because we wouldn't really know that uh, it's occurring otherwise. And uh, there are some things that you can modify uh, as far as your risk for going blind from eye disease by seeking care earlier. But I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mehta to touch upon another really common eye disease. Hello, everybody. My name is Mithil Mehta. I'm a retina specialist here. This, for some reason, this first slide is not showing the picture, so I'm just going to show you this picture because it's kind of useful. Uh, we're going to talk about age-related macular degeneration. That's just one disease, but it's the majority of what I take care of in people over the age of 60. So age-related macular degeneration. So what is the macula? The macula is the center of the retina. On this drawing here, you can see an eyeball here with the eyelashes. The back of the eye is covered in something called the retina. That's neural tissue that allows you to see. That's where the rods and cones are. The center of that tissue is called the macula. And the macula is where the highest density of your vision comes from. So it's right in the middle, in the back of the eye. This is the most metabolically active part of the entire body. So this, as a result of always being used, is the first to degrade with age, with macular degeneration. So macular degeneration is when the back of the eye starts to break down. And what it does, if this loads, is it does this, which is basically the opposite of glaucoma. So you think of glaucoma affecting the outside in, AMD, or macular degeneration, affects the inside out. So no matter what you look at, there's a blob in your way. 
It could be patchy, it could be perfectly round. Over time, you may even develop what we call eccentric fixation, which means you'll start to use something to the side here, up, down, left, or right, as the new center of your vision. The problem is, once you get out of that very center of your vision, the quality of your vision drops dramatically from a few microns away from the center of the vision. So that's the problem with macular degeneration. So what causes macular degeneration? I like to break it down into a few things. Genetics, you know, family history. If your parents had macular degeneration, you're at high risk of having macular degeneration. The sun, both UV, ultraviolet, and blue light. This goes back to what you were asking about, sir, with, yeah. the, with the, the polycarbonate lenses. Windows. Windows block UV light. But UV light is not the only cause of damage to the eye. A light bulb can cause someone to go blind. We call it light toxicity. You don't even have to have age-related macular degeneration to develop light toxicity. That's what we heard about with the solar eclipse, right? The sun will burn right through your eyes. Even if you're wearing sunglasses, polarized glasses, that's not enough if the light source is bright enough or on for long enough. And theoretically, if you've been alive for 70, 80 years, the light has been on for a long time, right? So this is something that you have to think about. And this is why cutting the light down with sunglasses helps that. We talk about blue blocker sunglasses. I'll get into more detail about that later because blue light is higher, higher energy light than red light. And so blocking certain wavelengths of light, we believe, can be helpful in the long term, especially if you do it earlier in life. Smoking. We all know smoking is bad for you. But why is smoking bad for you? Smoking is bad because smoking causes damage to blood vessels. Everything that is alive in your body has blood vessels and needs blood vessels because blood brings nutrients, oxygen to every living part of your body. And it also takes away all the toxic waste products. And smoking damages blood vessels. Inactivity, obesity, these are problems that a lot of us face. However, we all know they're bad. Cardiovascular disease, these are all a, a kind of a conglomeration of bad things that ultimately lead to bad blood vessels, which then kills everything. So don't do that. And life in general. If you're going to live long enough, you're going to have problems. Things break down. We have these things in our DNA called telomeres, which are portions of the DNA. And as the DNA replicates, these things lead to the DNA getting more and more damaged and not completely replaced every single time a cell splits. So life is dangerous too. So this is a patient with dry macular degeneration. You can see that there's these little yellow spots everywhere. These are called drusen. This is waste products of the eye. They're not being removed in macular degeneration. This accumulation, we believe, is not the actual damage, but it's evidence of damaged cells that are not clearing their toxic waste products. If many of you guys are my patients, and you guys know I get this OCT scan on you every time you see me. And the reason is, is that this scanner can see better than I can. With this scanner, we can see in a living person up to five micron resolution of individual cells and what structure they look at. This is what a normal looking OCT scan is right here. So you see this green line right here with my little cursor on it. If you take this line oops, and it's coming out like a blade out of the page and you turn it on its side, then you can see the layers of the retina here. And that's what the OCT scan allows us to do. It looks, lets us look in cross-section at something that with a microscope I can only look on face with this, like this picture. In dry macular degeneration, you develop atrophy of those outer layers. So you'll see how these lines suddenly drop off. It's because this line here is missing from there all the way to there. And then there's missing again. And all this buildup of stuff comes here. This is what happens in dry macular degeneration. This patient has a large area of dead retina right in the center of their vision. No matter what they're looking at, it's like a hand in their face the entire time. You can't get around that. So treatment for dry macular degeneration. There isn't anything. This is unfortunate. We're working on it. But what we try to do now is we try to prevent macular degeneration. We try to slow the progression with the blue blocker sunglasses. 
to block the UV and visible high energy light. There are clinical trials going on to slow the progression even more, but nothing has shown to reverse vision loss from dry macular degeneration. So we're stuck with things called visual aids to help you function better with what you have. But the doctor, what sunglasses should I buy? This is a question I get every single day, at least five, six times a day. Brown and polarized. So my lab uh, works on, on sunglasses and light, and this is why I'm able to answer your question, sir, uh, is that simple things like brown polarized sunglasses. A lot of people have those transition glasses, I do. My glasses turn dark, and a bunch of the scientists back in the day would always say how those don't help you. Well, I proved that that's not true. My glasses, the ones I'm wearing right now, I took to the lab, I tr tested the transmission of light through them when they're fresh out of a dark box, and then I put them out in the sun for 15 minutes in the parking lot right there, well, right there, <laughs> right that way. And I saw that I went from 50% transmission of blue light to 5% transmission of blue light with the pair of just transition sunglasses. So that's the first step. If you want to have some glasses, mine are brown transitions. So they transition to brown lenses. Uh, in, the, in the bright, when they're exposed to UV light. Computer video game glasses. A lot of people talk about these yellow glasses. And as Dr. Bott mentioned, your, your computer screen is not going to produce anywhere near the amount of light that the sun will. It's nowhere near as damaging as the sun. However, for your children and your grandchildren who are staring at a computer screen for 12, 15 hours a day, that's a different story. Because the sun doesn't shine for 12, 15 hours a day. And even when it does, people usually wear sunglasses or they don't stare at the sun. But a computer screen with the contrast turned up all the way, really bright, one of these giant screens playing Counter-Strike or whatever video game is popular these days, it's not good for them. So a lot of kids these days are using these computer video game glasses, which are not sunglasses. They will do nothing against the sun. They will help against a computer screen. They make these laser safety glasses that are orange. You may see them sometimes as these are the ultimate blue blocker glasses. That's true. I use them when I'm firing a laser. However, you don't need to walk around with orange glasses. They work better than all the sunglasses I own. They block 99 plus percent of the blue light and 100 percent of the UV light. But it's a bit overkill. And you look kind of ridiculous. So <laughs> don't do it. So wet macular degeneration. So wet AMD, the, the term wet means exudative meaning that there's a new blood vessel growing from underneath the retina, from this layer down here called the choroid, is growing up and see it's creating this little mountain. This is a mountain full of blood vessels that are leaking through this material, leaking fluid under the retina. It can leak it inside of the retina as well. This causes decreased vision. There is treatment for this. So first thing, prevention. You always have to start with prevention. This is, these are those vitamins that Dr. Bott was talking about. The AREDS-1 formulation, many of you guys were around for that, that had vitamin A as beta carotene, zinc, vitamin E, vitamin C. But we've gone to a new formulation called AREDS-2, which includes carotenoids. These are lutein and zeaxanthin. These are antioxidants specifically that are used by the retina. And by taking these specific vitamins, and they're available in lots of different formulations, but if it says AREDS-2, it's required to meet the specifications of the study that studied over 100,000 patients and show that these vitamins can prevent the wet macular generation in a certain percentage of people. Not everybody, but a certain small percentage of people. I recommend it for all my patients who have wet macular generation or advanced ma dry macular generation. But if you don't have macular generation, there's no point in taking extremely high doses of vitamins that are gonna, not going to do anything for you because there is a downside. You'll see there's zinc in here. Zinc is a heavy metal. Heavy metals in high doses <laughs> cause problems. We don't need these problems in people who don't need them. It's my opinion. Injections. So some people who have wet macular degeneration, they have bleeding in their eye. So what I need to do is I need to block the signal that the body is sending to the eye that causes the blood vessels to grow. That signal is called VEGF, or vasoendothelial growth factor. There are three approved medications currently, there will be more soon, that do directly treat that, that factor, that, that VEGF. And these work only if we inject them in high enough doses into the body. Avastin was invented for cancer, for colon cancer and breast cancer. That's what it's used for, in extremely high systemic doses. But we can give a much smaller dose into the eye 
and it'll attain a really high concentration in the eye, and it works very well. Lucentis and Ilea were developed specifically for macular degeneration. Avastin is used off-label, but because they make it in large quantities for cancer, it's a lot cheaper when they break it down into small little 0.05 ml injections for the eye. These other medications are quite expensive, so I usually start with Avastin, and then I move on to these ones if necessary, because they have slightly different formulations that may work better for some people than others. And before we had these three medications, we had something called PDT, or photodynamic therapy, with a dye called vertiporphyrin. And this is a cold laser. What this does is this, this dye goes into your veins. We infuse it over the course of 10 minutes. And as it fills your whole body, it will get to your eye. And then when enough has gotten into your eye that it's saturated all these new blood vessels, we apply this cold laser to those vessels, and it can cause them to shrink. We don't do that very often anymore. I probably do maybe three or four a year. But for a specific variance of macular degeneration, often that affects Asian people or African heritage people, these people have a form called IPCV, or polypoidal choroidovasculopathy. I won't ask you to spell that, but, <laughs> but it can help in addition with these uh, injectable medications. These medications have to be injected frequently often every month to start, and sometimes we can extend it out between visits, between injections. So non-medical treatment. These, these are the visual aids and things we're talking about to help you work better with what you already have that is damaged. Good lighting. I'm sure you guys are all noticing that you need a little more light than you used to to read a dark menu in a restaurant. Luckily now, you know, Apple and Samsung and all these companies have created a flashlight that I'm, I require to keep in my pocket. That is a very useful thing to do. Having a light source between your eyes and the paper allows you to read without having the glare from the cataract that you have, if Dr. Bot hasn't fixed you yet. And so this is one way to do it. You really want the light source between your eyes and the paper. Having light come from the front is going to add more glare, but having it between yourself and the paper is helpful. If you get a magnifier, you really want the light between the magnif magnifying glass and the paper, because that will help with glare as well. So magnification in general will help because if you're using your not central vision, your eccentric vision, your photoreceptors are not in high enough density to be able to see clearly. So you need bigger things. And so there's lots of magnification devices. You can buy a simple magnifying glass. There's these things called closed circuit TVs, which are basically computers. You can stick a paper underneath and it'll blow it up really big. And there's something that I'm working on called augmented reality. It's a company called Idaptic that I started. We have these glasses that you wear and there's a camera right here in the middle, and there's display screens inside here that display to your eyes, and we can do things to that image, make it bigger, increase the contrast, change the shape, move things away from your scotoma to let you see better. This is what the future brings. We're hoping to be able to make something useful soon, um, hopefully later on this year, but there's a lot of things out there. You need to know what your problem is and how to address it. It's nice to start with easy things like lighting, because it's already in your pocket or your purse. Or and magnification, you can get a magnifying glass pretty cheap. Uh, but going on from there, for people who need more, then we have more available, and more is coming as well. So I'd like to thank you. The, you know, we have a team full of retina specialists here. There are four of us currently. Uh, Dr. Cooperman, Barry Cooperman here, is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology. Myself, Dr. Brown is our newest retina specialist, and Dr. Liu, and soon we will have one more uh, Dr. Mohamed Riazi, who's joining us as well. We, we have a few things here, like uh, we mentioned earlier about my research, and Dr. Bott has quite a bit of research going. Uh, so if you'd like to help us progress to new treatments to help more people, uh, we need to work with our research. Uh, and we're always looking for funding for these things. So Janice Briggs is uh, our head of development here, and she's doing a wonderful job of pairing up grateful patients with our research community and helping us develop the newest technologies that will help people moving forward. And we have one more thing for macular degeneration. We won, run something out of our eye institute called amd.org or the Macular Degeneration Partnership. We are starting a support group for people with macular degeneration starting on May 15th. It'll be at 10 o'clock. It'll be right upstairs in the room behind you guys here. Uh, Jay Santos is running our show here. If you signed in, Hopefully you wrote your email address and he can email you uh, if you're interested in, in attending. It's free and it's just so you can meet other people who have macular degeneration who may be suffering from what you may be suffering from.
So it's hard to test that at home, basically, because you don't have a photo spectrometer at home, I'm assuming. Uh, and so you kind of have to rely on the company that makes them to give you a map of what wavelengths are being blocked by them or relying on companies that are reputable. Because unfortunately, these are not regulated by the FDA. We like to break block the higher wavelengths in the 400s, basically. 400s and higher. 400 what? 450. 450 and higher. Yeah, so one thing I do recommend for people, especially people who are very light sensitive, anyone here photophobic, very light sensitive for bright lights? There's a few people here. You can turn down the contrast on your computer screen. It's one of the, on the modes, when you go to the menu buttons, turn down the contrast, that'll decrease the amount of blue light. You can also shift the wavelength on some, some TV screens to move things more to red. And oftentimes your cell phones nowadays, uh, the iPhone has built it in, the, the Android has built it in, where you can red shift your phone, especially at nighttime. Sorry, I have to interrupt and just say one more additional comment with that. With glaucoma, your contrast sensitivity is often reduced. So if you have dimness of vision because of glaucoma or cataract, sometimes you may actually want to increase the contrast or brightness. <laughs> Having a tablet is wonderful because you have all of those options. So computer screens, tablets nowadays, you have the ability to fine tune what you're seeing specifically for your vision. Yes. So we're currently doing stem cell research on retinitis pigmentosa, which is a congenital disease, a genetic disease of the eye. Uh, we're working on, on injecting stem cells, and I, I'm the lead researcher in that project, actually, where we inject stem cells in people's eye for certain blinding conditions like retinitis pigmentosa. There are more along the way, but we're starting with this one right now. We're in FDA trials for that. Yes. That was easy. Yes, it helps your body absor helps your body absorb the blue light. It's a pigment that's already in your retina. Now, don't believe the hype. Not everybody needs it, right? People with intermediate to advanced macular degeneration were the only people to show any benefit from it. Not even early macular degeneration. mentioned earlier, if you're talking about people who are using it from childhood for many, many hours a day, then that could be considered damaging to the eye. But it's nothing compared to the amount of light from the sun. It definitely does increase intraocular pressure when you have an inverted position of any kind. So anything where blood rushes to the head, uh, will cause your intraocular pressure to increase temporarily. Or anything where you're bearing down and straining also does that. So patients who have very advanced glaucoma and have tenuous uh, intraocular pressure control, meaning it's not as controlled as you would like, probably should avoid those positions for a prolonged period of time because it will increase your intraocular pressure. For the majority of glaucoma patients who have well-controlled pressure and don't have advanced disease, it's usually not a consideration. The problem is, is that people want a crisp image when they're looking at them, right? So if you're not supposed to use a computer for 16 hours a day, most, people, most people's children, including mine, want to. I most certainly don't let them do that. But I was an exact person who had that problem. And back in the old days when we had those big CRT TVs, those reduced, produced radiation. One day when I was 16, I woke up blind because I had radiation keratopathy from the computer screen. Uh, my father took away my power cord out of my computer, and I didn't use a computer again for six months. And I still went to MIT, so it's still possible, but the point is, is, that, <laughs> is that, you know, 
These things were not meant to be used this much. So, you know, often patients uh, speak uh, colloquially about secondary cataract or recurrence of cataract, but in fact, cataract doesn't reoccur. Uh, one thing that does happen commonly is you can get a film of scar tissue behind the implanted lens, which we call posterior capsular opacification. Uh, so it's not exactly a cataract, but it's something that happens and is casually described as a secondary cataract. Uh, it's usually easily addressed in clinic with a laser procedure. So that's a follow-up procedure afterwards, during the monitoring phase? Uh, it could be at any point in the recovery. Some patients have it happen very soon after the surgery, others years after. Uh, the majority, not at all. It usually happens in about 30% of uh, patients who have cataract surgery with an otherwise uneventful procedure. Thank you. SLT is one of the laser treatments to help lower eye pressure. And because of its uh, property of not creating a destruction of the drainage tissue, it is repeatable. However, subsequent treatments after an initial effective treatment tend to have less effect. So over time, repeating that therapy multiple times will probably have less effect and less benefit. There can be. So uh, there are a lot of reasons why somebody can develop glaucoma, and specifically in closed angle varieties of glaucoma, uh, the cataract or the lens inside the eye in many patients has grown very large in size and is starting to push all the structures in the eye forward and closing the drain. So in some patients, cataract surgery is a treatment for glaucoma. Uh, if somebody has cataract with some other type of pathology that would limit their vision, uh, such as childhood cataract where they have amblyopia and there's limitations in the central nervous system to see, it's rare that it's not reversible though. It's a difficult question to answer. I wish I could give you one good response, but without knowing what else is happening or if there's any other pathology in the eye, uh, difficult to say. That's yeah, often a useful tool, trying to reduce astigmatism in patients who have keratoconus. The question was, can a toric lens be used in patients who have keratoconus? And keratoconus is a disease of the cornea that happens when there is an extreme amount of irregular astigmatism because there is a cone in the cornea, basically a very steep, uh, specific outpouching. Uh, and because it does produce a lot of astigmatism, a toric lens can help to reduce that if cataract surgery is being planned. So depending on how bad the astigmatism is, what the nature of the astigmatism is, uh, it, it is a tool that can be used in many patients to reduce that part of the prescription. No, when somebody is a glaucoma suspect, and the question is, does cataract surgery have any additional risk in somebody who is a glaucoma suspect? Glaucoma suspect means that there are some signs that you could be at risk for glaucoma or that there is something that indicates we need to screen for glaucoma, but we're not convinced that glaucoma is actually happening and it may not happen. So basically it's an in-between phase where we can't completely rule it out, but we don't believe that somebody has glaucoma. And can cataract surgery cause any adverse event? Not anything unusual beyond the scope of an eye that uh, was having cataract surgery on a routine basis. So it's hard to say, depending on how bad your mild macular degeneration is, what I tell people who have early macular degeneration, 
that we want to be preventative at this point. This is when we say the brown polarized sunglasses is the first thing we want to do. Cardiovascular risk factors, we want to exercise, not smoke, eat right, do all the systemic health things we can do, and get screened because people do progress from mild to advanced. So we want to watch that. And as we know, technology gets better, new studies are coming out, and so we will eventually be having people enrolled in trials for new drugs to prevent macular degeneration from getting worse. It, ARES2 has not been shown to help people with mild macular degeneration, only intermediate or advanced macular degeneration, and it only prevents the wet form from forming. It doesn't affect the dry form at all. It's hard to say because it could be caused by it was going to happen anyway or the pressure of the eye during the cataract surgery may have been involved. There's a lot of different factors that could be related. Usually when things like a stroke of the eye happen, that is a significant event that has to do with more like cardiovascular risk factors than anything else. I mean, so what it can is vary it? quite a bit. Uh, that picture is, is one attempt to try to demonstrate what it may look like if you have a cataract. But I but mean, somebody can have halos around stuff and then everything else is exquisitely clear. Is that a cataract? It can be. Some forms of cataract can do that. Uh, that's not the most common varieties of cataract, but one of the types of cataract that we touched upon, like the kind caused by <coughs> steroid use, uh, it can do that as uh, it presents predominantly <coughs> glare and halos. Is there a particular name for that kind? Uh, well, that specific kind is a posterior subcapsular cataract. Or but PSC. There are other kinds that can also do that. Cortical cataracts can. Uh, nuclear sclerosis, which is the most common kind where the peanut in the center of that M&M &M is becoming obscure. But you said posterior, right? Subcapsular cataract. No. I do recommend that children who decide they want to spend 16 hours a day on the computer or young people in their 20s and 30s who still have 50 to 100 years left in their life because we believe that people will live a long time now, we would recommend that they do it. But for the most part, I don't recommend computer glasses for most people who don't have macular degeneration. So there is a laser available to help with the incisions and steps of the cataract surgery. In some patients, it may be of more benefit than others. In patients who have a lens that is loose because of the cable support system not being very robust. In some patients who have astigmatism, the laser can allow uh, a correction that can't be done with a toric lens to take place. Uh, in routine cases, uh, it may not really add a lot of additional benefit over traditional techniques. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me talk about nutrition for a minute. So everyone talks about carrots and vision. This is actually a lie created by the American military to trick the Germans into not letting them know that we had cracked the Enigma code. So the British and the Americans were having radio signals back and forth conversations that they knew the Germans were hacking into that said basically they were able to see German, uh, they had specific people who were trained and given special vitamins, specifically vitamin A, to be able to see German fighter planes from 50 to 60 miles away. <laughs> so this is, it's been extended for many, many years. At least this is what we believe the story is told, why carrots have, are associated with good vision. It's, it's total nonsense. Extremely high doses of beta carotene, especially people who are smokers, causes cancer. So don't eat a pound of carrots every day. <laughs> don't do it. The only 
connection between vitreous detachments and macular degeneration is they both happen to people as they age. If you hate readers and you're willing to deal with a little bit of glare and halos that could potentially happen with that style of lens because you want to try to eliminate reading glasses. We generally don't recommend using a medication for prevention. Uh, there are some patients who don't have glaucoma in the strictest sense, but have elevated high, uh, high pressure. And we do use drops in those patients. But otherwise, without having a sign of glaucoma on testing and without having elevated eye pressure, uh, we don't generally have to start drops. For the majority of people, a normal eye pressure is 21 or less. Uh, that's in millimeters of mercury. Uh, higher than that is uh, something that would trigger the screening process for glaucoma. Uh, however, a normal pressure for everyone can vary. I have patients who have pressures that are higher than 21 and don't have glaucoma. And I have patients who have lower pressures and do have glaucoma. So everybody's threshold for developing glaucoma and the tolerance of the optic nerve for pressure can be different. No. There's no data to prove that the blue light from your, your, your phone and your uh, laptop are high enough energy to cause a problem in general. We believe it probably will. But if you're taking the steps to block the blue light from those things, then you're probably OK. Now, outside is a different story, right? The sun, way brighter than that. And the fluorescent lights, LED lights are now very popular. The ones you buy at Lowe's and Home Depot nowadays are usually very blue shifted. And those are bad. I don't have a single LED light in my house, put it that way. I, they, my house came with all LED lights. I replaced every light bulb in my house. No, sometimes some patients have cupping as a normal physiologic feature, just the way they were made, because some people, the pipeline is just larger to begin with. When you have the same number of fibers running through a larger pipeline, it would be natural that the hollow area in the center will be larger as well. So there's a lot of brilliant people trying to quantify and measure other things that can cause glaucoma to progress. We do know we have some patients who have very well controlled pressure and uh, they continue to have progression of glaucoma. So I'm gonna repeat the question. Is there anything else that we can treat besides eye pressure in patients who have glaucoma? And the answer is not right now. But we do think there are other things that are causing glaucoma to worsen. In some patients, it could be what we call neurotoxicity or a disease of uh, toxins in the nerves. Or in other patients, it could be a risk factor due to lack of blood flow or having uh, vasospasm in the optic nerve. Uh, and how do we quantify that? It's very difficult compared to measuring eye pressure. And what could we do to treat or modify that? It's also very difficult to know exactly what drug could target those mechanisms without being able to quantify it. So that's an ongoing area of research that we're trying to uh, better understand and identify treatments to modify. Floaters are annoying. Most people in the room have floaters. I have floaters. But the thing about treatments is that you have to realize there's a plus and a minus. There's a risk and a benefit. Floaters themselves are not dangerous unless there's so many that it's blocking your view. For the most part, everyone will get floaters in their lives. There's a few ways to remove floaters. Some people do a procedure called the YAG uh, vitreolysis, which uses a high energy laser, the same type we use to clean up the back of the capsule when someone develops a secondary cataract. 
They can use that to blow open a floater and explode it. I find that to be a bit dangerous, so I don't do that procedure. There's another procedure called a vitrectomy, which is the surgery we do. It's an actual cutting surgery where we go inside of the eye, we remove all the vitreous jelly, including the floaters. And we do this oftentimes as part of other surgeries to repair the retina or remove membranes and things from the retina. And that can also remove floaters, but there's a risk. There's a certain percentage of patients, depending on how extensive of a vitrectomy you do and if they've had cataract surgery or not, that have a downside to it. And some people I've seen go blind from the surgery from a completely uneventful surgery. Not in my hands, but I fix all the people's problems. Uh, here at the <laughs> universities, we, we get sent, when someone in the community has a problem, we tend to clean up the mess. Uh, and rare things happen. People have idiosyncratic reactions to all sorts of things. Uh, and so we don't know if it's going to happen. So in my practice, I tend not to advocate for, we call vitrectomies for floaters. Well, the short answer to that is no, uh, we don't have a way of regenerating optic nerve tissue or uh, being able to recover from optic nerve damage. Uh, there are many scientists who are working on stem cell treatments to uh, regenerate optic nerve tissue. Right now at our institute, we're using stem cells primarily for uh, retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, but hopefully one day we may be able to have an application in the optic nerve as well. Uh, specifically for having a lazy eye in childhood though, that is commonly a way of referring to something called amblyopia, which means that in childhood, the visual cortex or the part of the brain that can actually uh, perceive vision has to develop. And it develops because both eyes have a constant struggle uh, between being a dominant eye and uh, the <coughs> non-dominant eye. And that allows the visual cortex through that competition to develop the ability to process vision up into the age of, uh, depending on who you ask, somewhere between 7 to 11 years old. Uh, if you have a disadvantage in one eye because of having some sort of disease in the eye, uh, the visual cortex that can perceive vision in that eye never develops well. So even if that disease is reversed, for instance, if you have a cataract in childhood and develop amblyopia, even if cataract surgery is done and the eye itself is anatomically perfect, the part of the brain that would process that vision is not able to process it. All right, guys, thank you. Right. You can ask us for a favor.